Call the meeting to order, Madam Clerk. Could you please call the roll? Ms. Naylor? Yes. Present. Attorney Murphy? Present. Ms. Hurst? Present. Ms. Gresham? Present. Ms. Perez? Present. Mr. Collins? Here. Mayor Sarno? Present. Can we all please rise for a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I'd also like to uh, thank our or my Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, Health and Human Services Commissioner Helen Calkin Harris, and, uh, the Wizard of Oz Director of Facilities and Parks, uh, Patrick Sullivan, who are on, and I know they have long days too. So what we might do is, uh, before I turn over to the Superintendent, is to, to see if uh, Commissioner Calkin Harris and Director Sullivan would make uh, brief presentations and then uh, questions, a brief uh, a brief update. Any questions, or maybe I can be able to let them uh, go at that point in time. But let me turn it over to Superintendent Warwick, please. No, that's perfect, Mayor. I thought that uh, I know Helen and Pat have been going 24 7, so if there was any chance of having them make a brief presentation, you know, on the status of what's going on in the city, that would help frame the discussion. And with Pat, all that's going on uh, with retrofitting our buildings, and then open up any questions for them. And then we may be able to let them go and continue with the presentation. So I don't know. Commissioner Coulter, did you want to go first, Helen? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really um, don't have a formal presentation. I am here uh, to support Jeannie Clancy. I had an opportunity to speak with her earlier. Um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, I think everybody is probably clear um, that we are in a surge and our numbers, um, we had the highest numbers that we've ever had uh, last week. And so we continue to struggle uh, with uh, this pandemic in the city of Springfield. We did, and I, the superintendent can talk about, or Jeannie can talk about our vaccination effort uh, with the student athletes uh, that went well. I'm grateful to AMR for doing that. So we're excited. I did get the information today that the uh, sports are starting. And so that is uh, good. And we're hopeful that all will go well. We will schedule the second test uh, in the middle of the season so that we can um, make sure that our student athletes are still COVID free. Um, we did have five co positive cases out of, I believe it was 208. Uh, and that really is, um, is good. Uh, so there wasn't pervasive COVID uh, in the student athletes. Uh, we have started our vaccination process. Um, and I, uh, we, our third uh, vaccination session was held today to date. Uh, first responders and COVID facing individuals, we have currently done about um, 700 vaccinations um, at this point. And I look like this because I'm just getting home and couldn't wait to pull my clothes off. So, I <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, so again, um, I spoke with Jeannie earlier and we had a great conversation and my, my hope is to be able to support her and her plan and know uh, that the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, our epidemiologists, as well as our um, state DPH will be a support system for Springfield Public Schools as you move this forward. Um, the data um, is posted on our website. We did start our Vax Force uh, meeting today. The mayor and I had our first meeting with the Vax Force, uh, who will meet to make recommendations around uh, vaccines in the city of Springfield. Won't affect Springfield Public School students because, as you know, you have to be over 16 to get um, Pfizer and over 18 to get Moderna. So there may be some high school students who. Um, fall into the category and we certainly will work with Jeannie Clancy to identify those individuals. 
Thank you all very much, and I will yield. Thank you, Commissioner Helen Crawford Harris. I don't know if there's any, uh, so I can let Helen get some rest. Any questions for Commissioner Crawford Harris? Okay, and subsequently, if they are, then there's Quinn saying that they're probably Hannah. Helen, why don't you uh, get some rest, young lady, okay? You're mute. You're, you're mute. You're mute. Thank okay. you, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Why don't we go to uh, Director Sullivan, Patrick Sullivan, for just a brief update. If Thank you, uh, Mayor. So we're doing uh, well. We have received all of our iWave and the carrier OptiClean units. Uh, we have them in our warehouse. Um, many of the OptiClean units have actually physically been delivered to the school sites. Uh, we have finished our training of our trade staff to do the iWave installations, and we are now in the uh, final stages of providing uh, the superintendent so we can get out, hopefully by the end of next week, this schedule. But we feel very confident we're going to make that early March uh, date that we uh, discussed uh, two and a half weeks ago in your, in your meeting. So we will get that out to you. We are also anticipating a, a final report any day now from our Bob Kircher, the industrial hygienist. So uh, we should have that hard copied to you, but we didn't see any surprises. We're not expecting any surprises from what uh, was uh, presented uh, two and a half weeks ago at that school committee meeting. Um, I'm just uh, grateful to everyone for your support. Uh, we're I think we're going to do a good job in getting this uh, equipment installed, and I think it's going to help make a difference um, as you uh, bring your students and teachers back to the uh, school buildings. Thank you, Director Sullivan. I was with uh, Director Sullivan up in George, Principal Johnson, Georgia Johnson's place up there. It was really impressive what you're doing with the HVAC, the I waves, the, uh, the filters, the, the filters there, the bird filters, and I. So. But while I, I want Pat to get some, if any questions of Director Sullivan before we I let him go? Yes, Mr. Mayor, if Mr. I may. Uh, will we get an update from the hygienist again? Uh, we'll Pat, yeah. I'm expecting the hard copy report any day now, when I've asked it uh, to be an electronic copy so it can be. Uh, sent out uh, to, to the committee. So as soon as I, I get it, I'll, I'll forward it to uh, the mayor and the superintendent to get it out to all of you. But we're not anticipating any, any surprises um, at this time. The other thing, I guess, too, I should let you know, uh, Pat Roach had reached out to me and the superintendent to uh, do the same review for the uh, central office for those employees. Uh, for your main office building. And uh, so we are getting a scope to uh, complete that overview as well uh, to ensure that meets the ASHRAE standards. Thank you, Greg Sullivan. Also, Mr. Sullivan, one, one other question, I'm sorry. So now, will they have custodians in the building? And how many will be in a building per day to clean it or? To uh, custodians don't come under my department. That would fall under Pat Roach and Bob Mulcahy. So I, I'll defer. Uh, any custodial questions to uh, that division? Okay. Barbara, we have a staffing allocation for each building. It's based on building square footage and some of the unique needs of a building like a school. So every building's different. A school like a central has, um, and Bob Mulcahy can correct me, um, 12 custodians and a, a small elementary school might have one and a half or two. So so are they are they in a school building or or are they having other duties like traffic and stuff like that? What what would be their responsibility in the buildings? Everyone has an own their own individual job description, right? So that the head custodian has a little more free time in his day in order to um, you know support emergencies that the principal or one of the teachers may call them for while the other custodians in the building have a full cleaning schedule that includes bathrooms, classrooms, touch points, mopping floors, and, and normal cleaning. During COVID time, we've increased the amount of touch point cleaning anywhere that hands and germs would be, including bathrooms, doorknobs, railings, things of that nature. So, so would that be more than one person doing that? 
How many people would be doing that in a building? So every school is different. In a school like Central, they do three shifts and there's 12 custodians. In a school like Lynch, there's two custodians. And they're split shifts, right? So you'll have one custodian during the day and one custodian at night, and they kind of have some overlap in the middle. Mm. Okay. I just we're, want to we're be following sure. the industry standards for proper custodial staffing. We, we haven't cut our custodial staffing numbers at all. We have them all um, up to the level. The industrial hygienist reviewed our custodial cleaning plans and approved all of them and said that they're up to the, the appropriate standards. All right. I just want to make sure that they thoroughly clean in those buildings throughout the day, really. They're, I, and they're using those, uh, I see it here in City Hall, those spray guns. They have the, uh, the Pat Sullivan, the, the spray guns that are being used. So and they, when they work the floors and the, the doorknobs and everything. Pat, what, what are those guns? Electrostat? Are they electrostatic guns? And I know I, Dan and Pat, again, were very kind. You guys were the first to have them in the city. And um, I think we replaced the ones that you let us use early on uh, in COVID. So I, I, I uh, again, to Pat's point, uh, uh, school committee woman Gresham, uh, the industrial hygienist has reviewed the uh, plan, and I, I think you're in very good hands uh, with the plan that Pat put together with Bob Mulcahy. And the CDC is now finding that this virus doesn't live on the surfaces for long periods of time. So I think that we should try to get, maybe we can talk to Helen about getting that information over to you as well. We're going to still, I think they came up with one of our other updates. We are going to still pursue the, the key thing of the following the uh, health, public health break, the mask, and the, and the uh, ventilation. The movement of the air is key. But we're going to still continue to do the clean. <laughs> all the CDC is that, that it really is on a surface thing anymore. Are there some any? of the COVID grants that we got, we bought a significant amount of new custodial equipment that will allow us to do the jobs faster, will allow us to do them better, and, um, and, and be more efficient with what we're doing. Any other questions? Thank you. you. Director Sullivan, Pat Sullivan, so I can let them, if, if you do, if not, I'll, I'll let them go. Okay, Pat, uh, Pat, Director Sullivan, Pat, thank you very much. Yep. Thank and, you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Sullivan. Uh, let me uh, now turn it uh, back over to uh, Superintendent Moore. Thank you. Uh, last week, you gave you a copy of, of the plan that we've been drafting up for you to take a look at and give us some feedback and input on. So we got it out to you to take a look at. Didn't know if I gave you a quick overview, and then we just opened it up for questions and input, if that was the most reasonable one. So... I think some of the key pieces of the plan are the phasing in in previous meetings and on page three of what you have in your plan, you can see there's a phase in plan. Uh, we, we have a proposal for possibly considering four phases in that phase one, which we talked about in an earlier meeting of possibly coming back before April 9th. Um, you know, we have that high needs uh, SPED group that we've been talking about um, and that, uh, that we've had a few increase relative to from the commissioner uh, of when we can get those students back along with Worcester and Boston. We propose in that first phase our SLIFE kids, our kids with interrupted learning that are receiving the PLL services. And our 10 to 12 graders at Putnam Vocational uh, Academy for their vocational technical courses, they need hours and they need the hands-on piece. And that we've been working closely with Principal Johnson on trying to do that in our initial phase. Um, and again, um, based on what Helen says relative to the COVID rates at the time, there's an opportunity to look at at a time, perhaps in March, if, if the ventilation work was done and the COVID rates are declining and it's safe, that we consider uh, bringing them in. And that would be, again, subject to school committee decision. You know, possible phase two, beginning at the beginning of the fourth quarter, with some other grades, phase two, kindergarten, first, sixth, ninth, and twelfth. Then for phase three, you can see some other grades about two weeks apart, each of these uh, 
phase in groups. So again, working with principals and staff, it's important that we phase it in and not try to bring everyone back in at once because of the transportation piece and the issues around the building. And um, we also made a note that we've had uh, some requests from a lot of our teachers that if we're gonna have them phase back in, that they be allowed to come back and work in their classroom for a week before they leave, their kids would be phased in. So uh, we built that in as a proposal for you. You know, the student cohorts, there's not much change from what we talked about earlier. It's on page four, cohort, you know, A uh, and B, they'd be splitting Monday, Tuesday. Cohort A would be Monday, Tuesday, and every other Wednesday. Um, for live, and then the other piece remote, and cohort B, Thursday, Friday, and every other Wednesday for the live instruction, and the other pieces remote. Cohort C um, would be our uh, kids in, in those high needs groups we talked about, trying to bring them in up, up to five days a week if we possibly can, based on transportation and, and the class sizes. And again, all of this would be based on how many we'd actually, parents would have a choice here, any parent who wants their child to stay remote, but have them stay remote. And they'd be in our cohort R group, the remote only group. So again, it'd be based on parent choice. And a key piece of this would be us surveying the parents yet again, reaching out to every family with school staff, seeing what their will would be for the rest of the year, whether they want their child to stay remote or whether they want them to come back live. And we can base it all on your calls. Yeah, can I go back to page three just for one minute? Um, every other starting date appears to be Monday. Uh, phase two is a Friday. Wouldn't it make sense to move that back to Monday? You know, back to instead of the ninth to the fifth. I, I I would I would love to not start on a Friday. But that's the day the fourth quarter starts. So I wanted to talk to the school committee about that. Uh, I'd love to bring that to a Monday because it doesn't make much start sense. I just didn't want to violate what the school committee talked about at the last week. So we, we could, we could yeah, have we'd love, love to do that. And we we make it go to either move it forward or backward, but it doesn't make much sense to start on Friday. But it was the first day of fourth quarter. And that was the school committee. Just for the last week. Will we have to amend that with technically with a vote? If the school committee wanted to change that, we could we could put it differently in the plan. Uh, well, why don't we call people now so we don't? I mean, as you go yeah. on, we could forget to come back. So, with the indulgence of the school committee, that's a good point. Um, would you be would we be open to starting this Monday the fifth of April? School committee members. How do you feel about that? I may I speak? Yes, um, Mr. Mayor. I do feel that rather than going backwards, I'd feel more comfortable if we wanted to do a Monday with that following Monday okay. instead of okay. trying to move so, it up. You mean, in other words, the, the 12th instead of the 5th? I got you. Yes. What is that? When is spring? Well, well that, that would be spring. Break. Break. That would be spring no. vacation. Uh, Spring break would be the following week. Oh, okay. If we moved it to the fifth, we'd get two weeks before spring break. If we moved it to the twelfth, we'd get one week before spring break. Well, then, uh, maybe then you'd have two weeks of continuity. Because uh, all now, I never, I don't have an issue with the twelfth, uh, but we know we get a week in. So, um, how do people? Uh, how does the school committee feel if we go with twelfth, we would get one week in, but then go immediately to spring vacation, if we go the fifth, we would get two weeks in. So um, how does the school committee feel about uh, the back clarification? School committee members? Does it matter either? I'm sorry, Mayor, I'm, I'm, uh, if I could just clarify that. Uh, the, the We would start on a Monday, correct? Yeah, either Monday is the, the one would, would be either the twelfth or the fifth. If you start on the fifth, we'll get two weeks in before spring vacation. If you start on the twelfth, you get one weekend and 
be back on, you be on vacation, spring vacation. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I mean, I, I'm flexible either way. I mean, I, I would probably prefer the fifth, but uh, whatever you guys think is best. So, right, Murph is the uh, Tony Murph is the fifth. Well, Tony right now is the the twelfth. What about other school committee members? I mean, I see the rationale with providing two weeks, and I, I get that, but we've already told families and parents and the community the eighth, so I would go forward instead of backwards. I'd, I'd, be, in a, I'd be amenable to the 12th. Okay. Like a good point, good point. Okay, so Denise and uh, uh, Ms. Hurst and Ms. Taylor on the 12th. Murph is open here. What about uh, Ms. Gresh and Ms. Perez? I, I agree with the 12th. Okay. I agree with the 12th. Okay. Ms. Ms. Me, Ms. Mr. Mayor, I agree with the 12th as well. Okay. And that, that, that's pretty much a consensus. Yeah, we'll change that. Uh, as long as it's not a 12th. Friday. And, and, and and I think the, uh, a Friday made no right. sense. I just didn't want to put something in that. I think that Ms. Hurst's yeah. reasoning was yeah. good because we did yeah. say the 8th yeah. or the 9th, and yeah. that's better to. If you say, oh boy, you told me the eighth ninth, I made my adjustments already. Now all of a sudden you yeah. say, you have to go the fifth. So if somebody says, well, since you could have got two weeks in, well, this is the reasoning why. I'm. So uh, uh, Vice Chair Kyle? Yeah, no, okay. okay. So we'll go, if we can, we'll, we'll, we'll change, change the document to the, to the, the 12, 12. The next iteration. The 12. So, um, good. And that, the patron state, that doesn't come in. All right, so we'll, uh, if everybody agrees, do we have, we have to technically take a vote on this? I'll just, I'll just change it. Just for the technical. And then I think at some point, we're, we're, we're going to switch on the, uh, uh, with the, uh, phase two. On the 12th. We'll go on the 12th, okay? Yes. okay. Thank you. Now, Monday makes a lot more sense, but I just want to go by exactly what the school yeah. said earlier. And then when I saw it was a Friday, I knew it was awkward. So thanks for making that change. That's uh, true. So the cohort groups we talked about earlier and, and which kids would go in which cohorts. And the key piece to all of this, of course, is a personal contact to every family. So they make the choice whether they come back, is a live cohort groups of A and B or C, or they stay remote only for the rest of the year, which is in essence the last quarter. Uh, page five just shows you a diagram of what that would look like, um, which kids coming in which days, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, cohort C, just want to be very honest, we, we said up to five days a week. So, you know, these hypothetically um, are our high needs sped kids. If the parents wanted them to return, we'd like to do more days of the week if we could. Um, Arrange the transportation. We're gonna have very little capacity on our buses. There's like a, a sped bus that used to pull 20 kids, gonna be down to five. So we might not be able to bring all the kids who wanna come back in based on how many choose five days a week. We do as many as we possibly could uh, provide transportation safely for for those reduced numbers in the bus fleet. So <laughs> That piece is up to five. Yeah, I, I do. I, and I actually am glad you just said that, Superintendent, because I had a question about that. So I think I'm, I want to know the reverse. Is there a percentage that we are looking to have for in person that it's going to make, I don't want to say make sense, but that it's going to be worth bringing students in. So I, I, can't, I don't believe that this will be an issue, but if we don't get enough folks to opt in, then what? I think that's an absolutely fabulous question. So for example, in your A and B cohorts, uh, the bulk of our kids, um, if the numbers who opt in are very low, instead of running Monday, Tuesday, and then you know Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that kind of thing. We perhaps could change that A and B cohort into five days live and leave the remote kids five days remote and be able to safely bring them in with the six foot parameters and the safety guidelines and so on. 
I looked at what Worcester did. We've been working closely with Worcester and they're, they're, they were ahead of us relative to their plan for return. They were gonna return the kids sooner. Their initial plan was to come back in in, in uh, January. But given the, the rates that are going on right now, they have since delayed that. But in looking at the plan and meeting with their team members, they're ahead of us with the survey and their survey was some going somewhere around, wasn't exactly the same in every building, but, but somewhere in the 50% range. So if, if, it's, if, if it's in the 50% range, given the, the limitations we have in the buildings, I think we have to stay in A and B. If it goes lower than that, we perhaps could bring the kids in um, all five days. And that's something we'd explore and have a discussion about. Don't know how that's gonna go until we actually uh, survey families. We were running in the 50% range back in August when we did some outreach and, and back in the spring, but I don't know how that's gonna go. I mean, the rates are just terrible right now. I don't know how that's gonna influence and that could happen. So I think that's worth exploring if it's very low to see if we could bring the kids in on a more regular basis, which I think would be better for families. We just couldn't guarantee that until we do this survey. Thank you, Mr. Surge. Okay. Yep. Um, it's me. Next page uh, talks about the system. Was there another question? I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Did I interrupt someone? Yes, that was me. I was. I had my hands raised, but I think I'm on the other screen, so you might not have seen it. Um, I apologize for that. So I, my question, my clarifying question is on the cohorts. Um, I know at one point there was a proposal to have Wednesdays open yep. and be able to clean or what have you between cohorts, but that's not an option any longer. Can you clarify why that's the case? Yeah, in looking at things, uh, we were thinking about that if we were gonna start back in September or October. Given how late we're starting back, it, you know, we're trying to get more live days for the kids because they're not going to have many live days. And we have the cleaning plan set up, so we don't, we're not going to need a full day Wednesday for cleaning. So the idea was we're making up time because we're only coming back in the fourth quarter. So that's what many, many districts did. They looked they're picking up that day. Plus the CDC now is, is uh, put across that this is not really a, uh, uh, on, on, on you know inanimate objects anymore. And we're going to still do the cleaning. They're saying more to no. you know, we're, so. We've got a full cleaning plan. We don't need that yeah. on Wednesday. And you're you know we've lost three quarters of the year by the time. It gets Mr. Roach, Pat. Yeah, and as part of our cleaning plan, we're going to be cleaning every classroom and every desk every single night, including all the door handles. So originally we needed the Wednesday cleaning and built into our system in order to ensure disinfection. But we're going to be able to do that with our new equipment and our new cleaning. Plans. So we can we can still proceed and um, utilize all those days to get the kids back in school. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Latoni. I can't see on the screen, so I don't know if you have any, any more questions or comments. No, sir. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This is going to work. Yeah. And, and again, the other piece is the, the staffing piece. We're going to, you know. I was talking to Matt Malone, uh, Paul River, who went back early. We've been trying to contact the urbans that went back early and find lessons learned, what, what went well, what didn't go well, build it into your plan. And he was telling me, yeah, the biggest problem I had was uh, having staff available uh, for the hybrid piece and, and going through that. So, you know, the, the, the human resource piece is a key piece and what our work with the union and we're in the process of now of talking about potentially negotiating a hybrid return is uh, making sure that we have enough staff to staff the hybrid uh, model. You know, folks would, uh, we, we did tell the union that we'd be willing to look at folks who have a medical note and have a pre-existing condition that we'd let them work remote to support the kids that way and uh, trying to um, work with staff. So we're reasonable around that with the idea that we have enough folks too in the buildings to provide uh, the services necessary. So we're gonna be working very closely with that and be getting updates on how, how that piece is coming in as HR is handling that. Ms. Sirs? Yes. So superintendent, how does that get 
decided? Are there certain pre-existing conditions that are more priority or more serious in nature than others? How, like, how does that get determined? Or is it that anyone who submits that they have a pre-existing condition and or a doctor's note gets exempt or gets, or is able to, to be remote versus in person? So there's certain, uh, certain pre-existing conditions that are affected by COVID and those mm -hmm. are the conditions that fall within the description. So the doctor's note would cover those in the condition. But I think Melissa could speak to this better than I. So I, I would like Melissa to just jump in and give you a better answer to that question. Attorney Shea, please. Attorney Shea. Sure. Uh, the superintendent, absolutely correct. There are certain conditions that are identified there uh, by both uh, the CDC has been keeping an ongoing updated list. So that's where the language actually comes from that says that may put the employee at an increased risk of harm if exposed to COVID-19. There's also a category of risks that, or the employee has a condition that makes them particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. So uh, those are two separate categories, both, uh, and there's a list of conditions under each category. In addition to that, then they um, submit the documentation to substantiate that. And what we, we've been working, um, using this process already to try to, to gather information and having them submit it to human resources. And so there's why you have a couple of forms actually also on the on the plan referring to that, to help also maintain the confidentiality. So. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, is there, Ms. Hurst is done, or can you see all set? I, I am, thank you so much. Ms. Perez, please. Yeah, yeah um, this is probably to, for Melissa. Is H is one of the conditions? Because I don't see it there and I've been hearing a lot about it. I'm sorry, is one of the conditions? I didn't hear that, Ms. Perez. Yeah, I, H, H factor is one, is, is it one of the factors besides so, medical condition? Uh, so, oh, uh, yes, they do indicate that certain folks with, who are over a certain age um, mm -hmm. could be more, you know, could be, is a risk. And so we do have that information. We've been trying to track. We obviously we have the how old people are in our system. So we have we have that information as well. Ms. Perez? Yes. All, all set? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So again, you know, those are some of the, the key pieces of the plan. I know you've had some time to look at it. So I thought maybe the best format now would be for us to respond to any questions, concerns, and open it up for uh, more of a dialogue uh, at this juncture. And uh, again, the staff is ready to respond to any questions or concerns or, 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 or certainly uh, uh, school committee uh, members. But Melissa, Attorney Shea, can I ask a question? And, and uh, Ms. Perez had a good point on the age. If somebody, there's a you know, certain age, I don't know exactly what it is, but somebody, mm -hmm. they, they sign off, say, listen, I feel fine, I'm, I'm coming in. Is there a sign off on that? Because uh, I'm looking at the other side. Of it. If you are at a certain age, that qualifies, you say, listen, I am at a certain age, I'm susceptible possibly to this, I'm going to teach from, from, from home or remote. So is there... If somebody says, no, I feel great, I want to come in, I want to be with my students or teach from school, is there a sign off on that? Or I, I just... So the way that it's working now, and we can certainly have further discussion about it, is the it's the employee who makes a request to work remote. Okay, so it's not it's documented at that point. Okay. All right, school committee members, I'm sorry, I'll open up the floor. Yes. The thing I just should have emphasized as I open, this is a, a, a proposed plan. Um, 
this is all subject to impact bargaining negotiations yeah, with all the unions. We are going to have so to once we get direction on how we move forward, it's subject to the collective bargaining uh, piece that you know the government uh, put through. All of this is subject to impact bargaining with all of our unions. But if so we have to go negotiate it once we put it. Forward. But we're in a stronger position because we have gone above and beyond with the ASHRAE standards, the ventilation movements we're making with the uh, 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 carrier air units, the high waves, the MERV filters, abundant P PPEs, the cleaning plan we have. So, you know, to the teachers and the students that we can say, listen, we've, we've gone above and beyond and we feel confident uh, to come in. So, Ms. Gresham, I know Ms. Gresham. Yeah, nobody's done in. more about staff. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. So, are you concerned about most of the teachers wanting to do remote than being in person? Well, they have to get a medical note to do remote, and they'd have to have a pre existing condition to qualify remote. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, uh, are we concerned that if, if too many of them had these pre qualifying conditions, we could have a problem? We're certainly going to have to take a look at that and see how it's going. At, at the point we're at right now, it looks like it's manageable, but we're going to have to watch that very closely because that is a factor. But it's not just anyone who wants to work remote. They're going to have to have a pre-existing condition and a medical note from a doctor saying that they need to work remote because of this. So it's not just anyone who wants to do it because we, we probably wouldn't get enough people if that was the condition. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Question. Mr. Mayor, if That's I could. Yes. Uh, just to, to piggyback on what Ms. Gresham said, do we have any estimates uh, or any projections with respect to how many of our teachers and other employees would opt out if we did uh, adopt this return to school plan? I mean, so, do we have any idea how many people that would affect? So, so we know already who has already told us they would like to opt out and then we also know the folks who have already told us they'd like to opt out and they provided the necessary medical documentation so i'll give it to melissa to give you an answer of that beyond that it would be sheer projection but melissa could do a better job with that than I. attorney shea sure um so as the superintendent said we've been receiving um throughout you know, starting in August. We opened this up in August. So. Yeah, and we actually, we sent out communications to all staff um, together with both the para union and the teachers union. We sent out a communication requesting folks to let us know that so that we could start preparing and planning and keeping in mind back in August, we were looking, you know, at a, at a different, different options. Um, we ended up going remote. And then after um, um, the meeting in December where there was talk of when that we, in preparation for hybrid, we received um, just this past month since the holidays, another batch of folks requesting it. So we do have, we do have the numbers as we sit here today. We also have a, we have a projection of a, a high end of the numbers as well, but we're we like to work on actuality, so we're continuing to work to get the actual folks. Because the other thing too is for them to be able to have time to be able to get us the medical documentation. That's why we've been we've been um, focusing on it. I don't know if that answers your question, but we've been planning for this all along and had it on our our projection and have been asking them to submit us the information. How many do we have right now, Melissa, that have requested it and provided the appropriate medical documentation? I know you're keeping track of it. So approximately. So I um, approximately, I would say approximately 100 have with the documentation. My memory is correct. And um, a, a little in uh, probably about 75 200 more um, for various, for different reasons, asking to work remote, but haven't provided any follow-up. So we suspect that we'll be getting 
Obviously, as it gets closer, some folks might be waiting until it gets closer to get more updated medical documentation to be able to verify. So they've sent in the request, they just haven't provided us the documentation. So, so far, it looks doable. We'll certainly be informing the school committee as we move forward uh, what that looks like, because that is a key piece of the rest. And we might be able to do, I don't know if we can, some type of quick tour or virtual tour to, to show these teachers and staff all the physical plan improvements we have done and uh, uh, build a plan on the cleaning, but with the uh, eye waves and the uh, air, uh, carry air filters, the MRF filters, uh, to let them know that we've done above and beyond. So maybe there's, maybe there's somewhere we could be creative that way to say, give them a sense of Security. We've been meeting with the, all of the unions every week in a weekly meeting. Uh, we used to meet monthly before COVID, but since COVID, we've been meeting every week. So there's a tremendous amount of dialogue around that. So they they, they know um, you know all the things we're doing, and there's a good exchange back and forth relative to what's going on. Thank you, Mary. If, if I could just yep, go ahead. follow up. Uh, thank thank you. Uh, Attorney Shea. So those numbers don't sound too bad to me, but with respect to the plan that we have today uh, that you're presenting, are, are the unions, uh, if you, I mean, I know this is not collective bargaining, but are the union, do you think the unions would be on board with this plan or not? Um, you know, certainly we're hopeful that we could come to a, a settlement on this. Um, but again, I, you know, we have to get in there, roll up our sleeves and, and get it done. I hope they, they understand how much we've done for them. And at some point they have to agree to come back. I, I don't think it's going to be an easy uh, set of negotiations. I think it's very difficult because there's a lot of uh, anxiety related to this. So it's going to be some work to be perfectly honest with you. I'm, hopefully we can, I'm hopeful we can get to an agreement. No one's been better to our staff than us. We haven't done any layoffs. We've put in every safety protocol in place. So all that goodwill, I'm hoping, gets us to an agreement. But these negotiations, I think, promise to be very uh, challenging. And I also think that I know on the state level, the teacher leadership, about saying having all the prerequisites uh, done, which we're gone above and beyond physical, and then the uh, ramping up the testing type activities. And then uh, Helen and I are fighting uh, besides the testing to get as much vaccine as we can ASAP uh, here into the city. Um, so I, you know, I think we're, you know, we, we're putting it across our part of the, the deal. So I, I think it'll make it much easier. It's not gonna be uh, a slam dunk, but it, it's a little difficult for the weird we have all the placeholders there saying, here's the reasoning why we're likely to start a hybrid or come back. So I, I wish I could give you a better answer, uh, Peter, but uh, until we really uh, get going on this, um, we'll get a feel. I, I do think it's going to be a challenge. What we'll do during the process, once we get some direction relative to what we can negotiate, um, we'll, we'll bring you back uh, some updates as to how it's progressing. I'm hoping given all we've done for the groups, it's gonna go well. But again, I know it's been a challenge and more challenging in some place across the state. Than others. Yeah, before I turn over to Vice Chair Collins also. Thanks very much. There are other districts across the Commonwealth and across the, the uh, uh, United States of America who have laid off and who have furloughed. We worked very, very hard to right. keep everybody Work, work, you know, working and being able to supply uh, educational benefits to our students. Vice Chair Collins? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something you said, and I, I think you said it quickly and about perhaps doing a virtual tour. But right now, because clearly parents, and you're going to have to, the school department's going to be surveying parents. Right. Certainly right now, could we work with Focus Springfield to get some type of a film clip we could put on our own website and on That's there right too. that shows what we've done. Well, that shows an eye and explains what yeah. it does. 
shows have been filtered and get that stuff out right away so that people can go and view it before we're even calling them. These are the changes we're making to make your the air safe in the Pat, Pat Sullivan had a three minute video when we were on COVID 19, Danny, our cabinet had right, a, a right, hospital right, updates. Right. Right. So we have, I think, I thought he was getting there to Pete Cooney. Yeah, I, I think. But, so we could do that saying, this is what we're doing at yeah. these yeah. schools, this is what we've done at these schools. And these are the clip of the school. And here's yeah. the filter. And here is the island. Right, you could do that. Right. And then, you know, and then the then we have the cleaning and the PPE. Like hypothetically, you know, take for example Putnam. Putnam's new building, new HVAC system. We exceeded the, the NESI standards, um, meets the ASHRAE standards. We put the I wave in, you know, that virtually filters the air almost pure yeah. to even be safer. So we're really exceeding all the guidelines, and I think folks will feel good about it. So I'll work with Azel and we'll make sure we get that kind of information out there. And we've been sharing that with the union, they've been sharing that with their constituents. You know, they, they know we're gonna come up with a report by school. The carrier units, uh, you know, I know Pat gave you a quick overview for some of our older buildings, they're all in. We have one running here. Um, they're all in. You know, we're redoing the electrical to get them in. We're actually uh, doing better relative to the schedule than we were initially thought. So we're gonna be ready relative to the ventilation piece, I'm very confident of that for a safe return. Will that help us in negotiations? Yes, we will. Well, I'm not worried about negotiations as much as I'm worried about parent. Us, a parent perspective so is important. The sooner too. we right. can get out an explanation of that and the I rate <laughs> and get it up and yep. keep referring people to watch yep. it, we'll do that. It may change their mind when they when you yep. call them and say, Are you willing to send your yep. child in? No, that's it's a big factor too. Yeah, we'll do that. May I ask a clarifying right. question about the survey? I'm sorry, Ms. Taylor, then I'll go to this first. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the survey, I see that you say you're going to call everyone. Will that be the only way that you will be able to get the responses from the families? I'm just concerned about folks who you may not be able to get on the phone. So I said that, but I, I meant that, that uh, a lot of times when we send out a, a, a survey online, we don't get responses so that we try other ways to reach out. We'd be looking for the schools to reach out in every venue possible. Paul, do you want to expand on that a little more for us? But re reaching out in every possible venue, texting, calling, uh, emailing, having their, their classroom teacher uh, reach out would be what we would try to do. Paul, for, for more than like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo everything you just said, Superintendent. I mean, I we, prioritize calling largely because we get a much better response than we would from an electronic survey. But I think really we'll use every method possible. And to the superintendent's point, um, we will, in many cases, we get a better response if the, if the person asking the question is the closest to the family, right? So that's where the superintendent's talk about the classroom teacher or the staff in the school, as opposed to sort of a, a, a broad-based district message where it's like, kind of click the link so that's why i think we were talking about calling but you know i think we'll use kind of any method we can come up with um and different schools as you know some of them use class dojo some of them use remind so we'll even have schools use whatever is the tool that works best for that school to reach out to their families i said calling but i didn't mean that was the only venue that was just the most successful venue we had last night but we'll do everything we can to get to every parent uh, possible because we want. Now, I looked at Worcester's, interestingly, it ran around 50-50, uh, but after all their efforts, they were able to contact 90% of the families. Wow. So uh, this was a week or two before they were supposed to start. They were still working on that other 10%, but they got, they, they did get to 90. Right. So, but, but again, that work wasn't finished. They have that 10% they're still trying to reach out. So. That's what we try to do get it to get to everybody. You gotta to remember to also too on the town halls that we've done, the uh, uh, participation is very, very strong. And I'm, I'm sure we might look to you know do something to say here's a finalized plan and it's you know what we've done. So Miss Miss Hurst had a question, I'm sorry. 
Yes, I actually have a I actually have a couple questions. So my first the first one that comes to mind that I didn't see here is with respect to attendance for our kids who may opt in for one of the hybrid or belong to one of the cohorts, right? Who's a, who are attending hybrid. If for some reason um, a child does not attend because the the family is awaiting test results or the child, you know, is presenting with some symptoms, whether they're COVID related or not, but they, so they don't opt to come in. Can they opt to be remote? And how are we handling attendance? Yes, if they, if they couldn't come in hybrid, but attended remote, remote would count as present. So they, they, they be counted as present. Okay. And so for employees, um, so are there protocols, like for example, right now we have the travel restrictions. So are employees going to have to adhere to those restrictions that have been set forth by like the governor? So for example, I know at my institution, we have an attestation form that they have to attest that, you know, they don't have symptoms, that they've not traveled. You know, if you're sick, stay home. What does that mean and how will that then affect um, staffing and will schools be able to sort of flex? Like, you know, we're really understaffed right now. So can we shift, you know, a third grade teacher to school A because school B, you know, can 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 afford to not to not have them, and we're so understaffed. What does that mean? Or if not, does that mean we're going to be bringing in substitutes? So we have every plan of still having substitutes available in a pool, so that if a teacher goes out, we'd be able to fill in with subs where possible, and 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 uh, organize the staff. And then we have non-classroom assigned teachers that we can work with cover where, where we need a, a classroom teacher if someone was out. So we've been working internally. We also hired more zone subs to open the year to help folks through this process early on. And those zone subs have been working in the year are all trained on the learning platforms and can fill in and they'd be available to help also. So that, that would be the plan. Uh, we're we're going to have an attestation form. Uh, we, we've already uh, used that for, for our employees. And uh, Melissa, do you want to talk about the uh, folks who travel and, and how that's all going to be handled? What's your chat? Sure. So, yeah, so we, we, all, we have the attestation as well. Um, with regard to travel, the, the state has, um, so we follow the state guidelines with regard to, obviously on, we're under the travel restrictions. Um, and I'm not sure, was there a specific question with regard to that particular? So I guess I just didn't, uh, I guess I was wondering like, so is that like made clear because I, you know, we are all on, I asked that question because I know that it's a part of the attestation form at my institution that, you know, people have to understand that traveling, you know, puts them at risk. And if they're the teachers that are reporting, you know, for whatever cohort or hybrid session in person, that they understand that there are these particular, you know, guidelines that they have to follow. And so I didn't see that addressed here and was just wondering if that was also being shared and explained with employees, um, because we had done a bit of talking around the the medical ex, the medical excuses. Yeah. So on the attestation, it also addresses that. And since the state routinely, uh, well, I don't want to say routinely now, but in the past, have been updating the different. Um, they've been making changes to the the travel policy on the state. So we reference it and we reference it back to the state website, which outlines it. We also have put it in, um, I don't know if you recall, the safety protocols that went out to all staff. 
and reminding them of that, we'll probably we'll be sending it out again, and it'll be um, it's on the intranet. There was um, a, uh, we had done a PDF uh, with a Zell's voiceover. Uh, uh, PowerPoint sort of a training uh, that went out to staff during the year, but certainly will continue to send that out. We're going to be doing another update shortly and, and obviously again, um, and, and routinely. So, so yes, yeah, so just a short answer to your question is we have an attestation form. They sign off on the attestation form, list the different things so they can't have a temperature above a certain temperature, et cetera, et cetera. But it also refer, make sure that they comply with the, the state's travel restrictions. And we send out a communication. It's on our SPS intranet. And we also have sent it out to all staff um, in the past as well. And we'll continue to do that. Any other questions, Ms. Russia? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I know um, they have a screening sheet, a checklist for the students. Is there one for the staff as well? Or will they use the same one? So um, if I could, Ms. Uh, Gresham, so that is uh, what we call the attestation form that they signed, that they um, attested to. And what we, do, what we did was we had them, um, we provided the attestation form for them to review and verify and sign off on. And every time they use their ID to enter a building, that's they're attesting to the fact that they comply with all the requirements in the attestation so form. So that's, that's on a daily basis. If they were to go into the building on a, if they were to go into the building on a daily basis and scan their ID. Okay, all right. Now, who will be doing the, the checklist for the students? Who is responsible for that? Yeah, the COVID, the COVID screening checklist. So That's Jeannie, Jeannie, can you help us with that? I know she has a presentation. At this time, um, Students are doing it at home prior to coming in. So when we've had the SAT students um, come in, it was done electronically. If a student didn't complete it, then it was completed prior to them entering the building by a staff member. Um, it could be the nurse. It could be um, like the school psychologists are calling parents and completing it before the students come in the building. When we open, the plan is to educate the parents and have them complete it because it's key that no one only with symptoms, but it's important that if you have the other questions added to that form, is there someone in your home that has COVID? Have you been told to self quarantine and have you traveled? So then the, the child bring it in and give it to the teachers or how do we keep track of that? We haven't, um, we haven't formalized that education and that process yet. It's still in a draft form. I just have the form discretion. Yes, yes. So, and we're working on the education piece. So far, the form is working and it's important that we get all that information and that parents really understand that any symptoms you can't come to work, but it's just as important if you have somebody in your house that has tested positive that exactly. you stay home. So somehow we have to do that education piece and I'm open to any ideas that anyone has to, to move it forward for the parents. Okay. Yeah. I know we, we, no. we need to be assigned agreement by the parents, that kind of thing. Ms. I think that was Ms. Ms. Gresham's good idea. Was Ms. Naylor? I was gonna. I had a follow-up question to that. Ms. Gresham, were you finished? I'm, I apologize if I cut you off. I have one more question. Um, so are we. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So what um, schools are we? Are it's going to be district wide that we're opening up with the hybrid, or how is that? 
do we have certain schools or? You know, with hybrid, it would be certain schools to begin with, the schools that have low incidence programs, slight programs, and what. On April uh, 12, all of our schools would be open. Okay. But only certain grades phasing in. So, you know, it wouldn't be all the grades at all the schools. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. I mean, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Taylor. So my follow-up question, and I'm just going to ask two for just to get them both out the way. Um, the frequency of the attestation forms, how frequent will that be done? And will there be consequences if folks are not honest? Specifically, so the differentiation would be students and families and staff members, if there will be consequences if we find that folks have not been honest on their attestation forms. So um, I, I'd like to start with Melissa relative to the staff, because it's going to be a different answer relative to the students. Attorney Shea, please. Sure. So they sign the attestation form, which lists all of the conditions and all of the requirements that they have to meet in order to be at work, including you know compliance with the travel uh, restrictions. They sign off on that and they confirm that every time they use their ID to enter a, a building that they are attesting to those factors. So that's the frequency. Every time they enter a building, they, in order to enter the building, they are attesting to that. Um, with regard to consequences, certainly like in, in anything, failure to comply with policies, procedures, protocols could subject individuals to after investigation subject the, the individual to disciplinary action. Um, typically with regard to unions, as you know, we follow progressive discipline, progressive discipline with regard to, unless it's egregious. So typically it would start with like a verbal counseling under the rules of, you know, the uh, progressive discipline. So that's typically, if it's egregious, then it could be, you could skip any of the steps of progressive discipline. But that's with regard to staff, how yeah, we envision it working. What we're talking about is looking at um, safety and where, where uh, students are putting other safety at risk. We wouldn't necessarily take discipline action. We'd work with the student, we'd work with the family, we'd give them a warning. But if folks are uh, repeatedly violating we have to sign them remote because they're endangering the safety of those around them. Does that clarify that? It does. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a nurse fancy making a presentation? Any presentation to questions. All right, uh, last go around if there's any questions or comments. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do have more questions. I just thought you were going to keep talking <laughs> lots of documents. I didn't want to keep asking questions. Oh, no, no, no. That's what there. Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple of other questions. So one of them is regarding the uniform policy. Will there be any leniency on the uniform policy? Or are we going to enforce it and, and discipline students as if we, as we've done in the past? That, that would be, that would be uh, we would follow whatever the school committee direction is on that. That's a school committee policy. So if you wanted us to let up on that, we would let up on it. If you wanted us to enforce it, we would enforce it. So that would be a, a, a decision the school committee would need to make because that's a school committee policy. That's okay. a good question, Ms. Taylor. I, I, I if, say, we, say we did give a little leeway I think that would have to be temporary because I think our, we're the envy with the school uniforms of how we get able to do it. So I, I you know, we probably need some flexibility on that. You know, one, one thing possibly school committee could consider would be um, some type of survey to parents to see how they feel about it. When we actually put it in place, and I was really surprised this at the time, it was the parents who wanted the uniform policy and loved it, actually they demanded it. it. So, but we follow your direction on it and uh, whatever you think is appropriate. 
I'm not insinuating at all that we shouldn't have uniforms. Um, I, 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 believe, I, yeah, I just wanted to clarify it just because I know we're recording. I want to make sure that I'm not insinuating that we should not have um, uniform, but I know that at some of the schools, it's been problematic for folks um, coming in with uniforms and kids have been sent home or have been disciplined because of, they, of not having their uniform. So I would just hate to see kids come into the building and be sent home because they don't have their uniform, you know, without a good reason as to why that. So that, so that's where I'm asking is just for clarification as far as how much attention we're gonna pay for four weeks or six weeks that we're gonna be in school. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and we, we follow uh, school committee direction on it. But like I say, we're, we're open to suggestion on that. We re really always have tried not to, not to send kids home and try to find resolution at the school where possible. But we follow your direction on that because that's the school. Committee. Yeah, we, we, want, uh, we want the kids to stay yeah, in school, yeah. unless it's something egregious. Yeah. We want them in school. Ms. Uh, Ms. Naylor, if you're all set, I know Ms. Hurst has a question. I'm going to be quiet for now. <laughs> Somebody else might ask some of my other questions. Ms. Thurst? No, I actually was going to ask this, the, the same question only because I feel like we did hear that in some of the town halls that we, uh, or the town halls that we held, people had asked about the, the uniform question. Um, but on the flip side of it, right? So there's always two, two sides of that is that I've also heard from parents who have said that sometimes buying regular clothes might be more expensive than having a uniform. Right. I mean, I, I can see both, I can see both, both sides. It's gonna be expensive to have to go out and buy period, right? It, it, depending upon, you know, the family. I guess my question is when we call to do the survey about whether they are going to return might that be a question that we're able to ask at the same time? Yeah, and, and also we need to, I think we're gonna to have to do some uh, logistic work with the stores or the suppliers of uniforms. Will they have them available? You, yeah, that's a very good they, point. Your stock-wide thing, so listen, there's no play right now on this market because the kids aren't, so that's another thing too, because we're gonna do that and so she's like, I, I went and tried to get the uniform. So I, I can't find them anywhere. So that's another play there too. Uh, Ms. Hurst had that question. So we better work. Yeah, I, I think we could work with Paul and find a way to survey parents, whether we add it to this survey or come up with a different survey. But we definitely could get you. You definitely want some feedback from parents to help you make that decision. So, uh, Paul, do you want to uh, add to that? No, I mean, I certainly we can do that, right? So, and we can do it either way if we want to get the data sooner and, and before we have the chance, before we're ready to go out and do the survey about the return, we could certainly do something earlier. I would, Mayor, I would suggest that early in March, if they can get the data, that the student and parent concerned subcommittee meet and review the data and come up with a recommendation for the full committee. Uh, there might be other issues we might have to have subcommittees meet in the meantime if somebody thinks about some. Uh, but that one particularly, I think we probably should do. And we, we, probably, we probably would need some type of correspondence or communication to the establishments or the stores that normally sell uh, the uniforms. And if they say, hey, no, we're ready to go, we'll have them. And find this, geez, we're gonna have a problem with it tonight, but Ms. Naylor indicated we're gonna have to be, we're gonna have to be really, really flexible. And some of the schools have been good about building up some stock so, piles yeah. to help the families too. Because well, they're following the policy. Plus kids yeah. kids grow too. Yeah. So yeah. they might say, Well, you should have you should have your uniforms ready. Hey, my kid, my kid grew. I, I so I didn't go out and buy anything if you were in we were in school. I also think we don't want it to be a barrier to someone absolutely opting into hybrid. That's right, absolutely. Absolutely. So it only, I think it would only be extending something that's egregious or out of line uh, where uh, uh, something would have to be looked at with that student. But other than that, we, we want them in. Any other questions? We'll, we'll do a survey and get to some feedback. We'll work on that. 
Any other questions or comments? I have a question about um, social emotional um, piece and the professional development. So I do see that there's some professional development around hybrid and transition, which I think is really great for the staff. If we can get a little bit more detail on exactly what those topics are, um, as far as what type of training the staff are receiving to prepare for transition. And then I also noticed that this, for elementary students, we have social emotional learning time built into their schedule. Um, I wanted to know if we have any thoughts about ensuring that at the middle school and high school level, we're also thinking about some type of social emotional supports outside of the counselors being available to them. Because yeah, it's going to be an anxiety. Yeah, there's going to yeah. be anxiety. So we better want to write. I think uh, Yolanda could speak best to that, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson? Yeah, there's going to be anxiety. Good evening, everyone. You made me sit up in my chair. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. I'm here. <laughs> um, um, as it relates to um, the social emotional learning needs of our students as we transition at the beginning of the pandemic, um, our school counselors received quite a bit of professional development on being able to address, um, you know, the cognitive behavioral needs of students in a way that. Um, they could support students as well as um, the teachers in the classroom. Um, because as you know, our, our children spend the majority of their time in class. So we spent quite a bit of time um, the spring um, addressing you know, um, specific strategies um, around um, behavioral needs, as well as um, being able to identify um, how to best support the development of, of functional behavior assessments and behavior plans if we saw you know, that um, students' needs warranted that. In addition to that, we have continued on that journey with, um, as you know, we're implementing second step at the elementary school level and you were very clear about acknowledging that. At the secondary level, we are, our students, they have advisories, um, crew, and that is also viewed as a place to build community as well as um, really um, be a check-in for students around their emotional health and wellness. Our counselors are during their training, um, it, it's a model that we try to not just have them with the skill set, but how can they more importantly support the teachers in the classrooms with students so that teachers feel supported and students feel successful. Um, and that's ongoing, um, you know, Considering where we are as a nation, there's a lot at us, you know, so we're addressing, you know, um, um, isolation, anxiety, but we're also trying to balance that with trying to support students around unrest and, and all that's happening around them that will, you know, once they're in school, all of that will continue to um, bubble up and um, be evident in our learning spaces. You know, so supporting our counselors in that area so that they can coach and support um, teachers in the in the classroom is, is, is very important. So the topics specifically, um, we are going to be um, in March, we're going to be doing um, looking at some anti-racist practices um, from a social work lens, a clinical lens, as well as from a school counselor lens. And, um, and we're gonna be looking at, um, as we transition back, how do we look at our school counseling program in, and kind of integrate those strategies to be able to respond to our students, um, you know, across their academic needs, their um, their social needs, as well as transitioning our students from grade to grade and level to level. So I don't know if I answered your question, um, Ms. Naylor, but I'm happy to entertain more. Dr. Johnson, we have a very appropriate uh, with Dr. Reverend Dr. King in the background with uh, an mm -hmm. day coming up. But yeah, uh, open the questions or questions for Dr. Johnson or any other school committee members. Mr. Mayor. I have a question. One of the things that I don't see when it comes to supporting the transition of the students, 
I uh, know that in the Hispanic community, we have a big impact of people passing away. And I mean, um, I, I, I don't know how to formalize it, but it, that should be part of the discussion also because it, it has been a great impact. I think that um, not only the anxiety, but the aftermath of what's going on with the COVID-19 as well. I think that it should be part of that um, um, of discussion as well. Dr. Johnson, great point. Could you elaborate on that? Because I, I, I you know, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, people have lost uh, loved ones and friends, young and old. Um, your, your thoughts on that, Ms. Dr. Johnson? Um, yes, I was just going to share that. We are, um, our plans have been a little delayed um, due to our, um, our start to the school year. But um, by the time we, a little into um, when we return in April, um, we are gonna have a team of about 20, 20 ish, over 20 counselors and um, three to four administrators um, trained, um, some, doing some crisis training, but not just crisis training in the sense of, you know, um, a student outburst, but really how do we um, respond more globally um, to our, the needs of our school and the organization NOVA, um, they are the same organization that provides training for Homeland Security. So we are planning for, um, you know, um, loss um, as it relates um, to students, staff, in, in any um, community um, disaster. I mean, as you know, we had a, a, a um, tornado um, a few years ago, and anything that could um, spill into our schools that's community related, I can only I, I can only imagine what our lives might have been like if we were in session last week, um, mm -hmm. considering the um, the violent um, episode at our our U.S. Capitol. So mm -hmm. this training in it, it's only the beginning. Um, but it will definitely allow us to build our repertoire of skills um, so that we can be um, easily deployed across our district to support our schools. And we currently support our schools now across the district. There's a team of us that we do that, but having some more specialized training in light of um, um, the COVID pandemic, um, um, Ms. Perez just stated, as well as um, violence in the community, um, anything catastrophic that we can be able to better support our students and our staff. So that's in the pipeline. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Ms. Perez. No, no, no further question, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Hirsch? Yes, I do actually. I, it's, um, so when I was listening to Dr. Johnson talk, it made me think, and I think it's somewhere in the, in the, in the presentation about um, the buildings being used. Um, it was somewhere where I read it, but I guess my question is, are we, so if we do hybrid, is there going to be any before or after care for families? So, you know, for example, um, like my kids go to Harina, you know, they had project coach, there was a playful minds. Are parents going to be, have the options of those before and after care um, services or no? So they opt in for the, for the hybrid. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like Lydia to come on. She's been coordinating all those services. Our assistant superintendent, assistant superintendent Martinez, please. Good evening, everyone. So yes, um, there are many providers that will be working with us to see what we can do before and after. As you know, some of them are providing the services now. Um, as we are remote, they do have children at some of their facilities. Um, they open at 7.30, most of them. And so um, we've been working with all the community members. They're waiting to hear what we're going to do so that then we can work together to kind of figure out what the services will look like. So until we know, um, they're not sure, but right now they are providing those services. Right, so is there a possibility um, that they would resume services 
at the school for whatever days we are in session? So right now, um, they are not providing any services in our schools and we have not made that determination yet. They are providing them at their own facilities. And mm -hmm. so depending on what our hybrid model looks like, we'll work with them to figure that out, but they will be providing the services. The where is still what we're waiting to hear, what we're doing first before we decide what we can do with them. Thank you. We certainly want, Lydia's done a great job coordinating this to, to reach out and try to help families the best we can by providing what we put in the school as well. Appropriate. Any other questions or comments? I do. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> two, two more questions. So the first question is about our assessments. Are we going to continue to have assessments? Um, I know there was a conversation in December and we were still waiting um, for some decisions, but I did have a question about assessments and how that would happen in a hybrid um, model. And then the last question is the teacher evaluations. Are we going to be doing those? this year and um, or monitoring and what does that look like? So great, great questions and uh, the MCAS has been going on. So the most recent update from the department uh, from, from Jesse is that uh, we don't have to do the 12th grade uh, makeup and they are gonna allow the kids to get the CD like they did last year by taking and passing appropriate coursework. So that was good news. We're going to have to bring those kids in January. They had missed other opportunities for a retake. It would have been outrageous to hold them up for a diploma. So that piece was positive news. Uh, there's a great push across the state from a lot of groups relative to the other grades, saying let's let's uh, not take MCAS. What Desi uh, did so far is they pushed access out into the spring. So that was going to occur earlier, um, and, they, and they're talking about looking at all the assessments and seeing if they can uh, shorten the time. And, um, you know, grades 3A and the, the 11th grade taken last year's to the 10th, they're, they're talking about a shorter uh, battery of assessments. But as it stands now, their plan is to still go on with those assessments, but there's still a lot going on in the state. I'm sure MASC is going to wait, want to weigh in. I know MASS has weighed in heavily, and uh, EMTA and other groups trying to push back at that. Uh, so far, um, we've gotten some concessions, but I, I think they should be canceling all those assessments. But uh, you know, again, I think there's going to be more debate. On the other side of it, you have MBAE in the business community. Some of them saying you still need these assessments. Truth is we don't need these assessments for diagnostic purposes because we give other assessments constantly. So um, we don't feel we need those or they're appropriate at this time or they're worth the time and money to administer them. So that's where we sit on it as a group, as a superintendent's group. And I think most of the other groups that work at schools feel the same way, but some folks who have never worked in the school have other opinions. And, uh, so it hasn't, I, I do think we've gotten some positive movement, uh, but, but I, I do think if we all keep pushing, we may even get um, a better resolution to it. So as it stands now, shortened assessments in the spring is what they still have on the schedule, but I think they're subject to debate on that. And then when we push back in our meetings at the commissioner, uh, the commissioner has indicated to us that he's, He's not 100% on this. I know he's getting pushed hard by I believe, the Secretary of Education on it. But I think if other groups weigh in, if the legislature weighs in. So I had a lot of good feedback from all our letters to the legislature. So I think if everyone weighs in, we have a chance of winning this fight. We got a partial win on it. Um, I'm sorry. No, does that answer the assessment question? It does. It helps. Thank you. Did you have another question? Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, evaluations. We're actually moving ahead with the evaluation. We're doing. We're ahead on our observations. So the principals are doing them. You know, using the technology. Um, 
I sat in a learning walk today at one of the schools and the principals are in the rooms, they're doing the observations and the, you know, they're doing the conferencing and the feedback remotely. And our evaluations are, we're actually ahead of where we were last year completing all of us. So we're, we're in great shape there. And we negotiated how we were gonna do that with the union successfully back when I was. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I have, I have one more. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. back to Ms. Taylor, and then I'll go to I'm sorry. Um, the student learning. Um, I know last time we asked about the grades and kind of where students were far, as far as students' failure. And I know there's a lot of students that are struggling with remote learning. Uh, can we get an update as a school committee on, on what those numbers look like now that we've went into another quarter? And, um, and what is the plan? And, and this may be another conversation for another day, but what's the plan to help get those kids on track so that they can uh, still either move to the next grade level or graduate um, so that, you know, to remediate in any way possible? So we we're constantly looking at, and teachers constantly assess, and how we can ramp up, even as we're in a remote, how can we increase the direct instruction time, provide more direct support. So we're constantly looking at ways of doing it, providing more interventions, and we're gonna to continue to do that, and we'll continue to do it as we move to hybrid, constantly trying to up the ante. We can get to the data from the first quarter that I saw, the data relative to uh, course failures and things like that, wasn't up that much over the year before. So I thought that was a positive. Uh, second quarter, we'll get that to you as well. Ms. Baylor? Thank you, no more questions. Ms. Gresham, please. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, do we have a timeline to submit anything to DESE? So uh, DESE uh, asked us to um, move the high needs kids back in and come up with a plan. Uh, we have to submit tomorrow to them on that. And we're simply going to say the school committee is what we said is we're meeting on it and looking at possibilities, but absent school committee approval, we couldn't give them any plan if the school committee hasn't approved it. So we're letting them know we're going to meet. Our goal is to get kids back in as soon as we can do it safely. And we'll have more details when school committee approves a plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gresham. And we have, and, and I just gave you a synopsis of it. There was a lot more to it than that far. But in essence, we couldn't give them what they want on the date because I'm not going to submit a plan to DESE that school committee has approved. We signed off on it tonight. We have, and again, we're pressed. That's why we're meeting. We have draft plans yep. already, and, and we're, as we should, going um, yep. through it with our school committee members, and then we'll take a, a final vote. Everything we're doing is proactive gearing to get our kids back in, so I, I think they know that. We are publicizing that, too. But they know it's subject to the approval of school committee, and uh, we weren't going to submit any commitments until school committee approves the plan. And still that's subject to, again, Say, hypothetically, we say in mid-March, hypothetically, we can bring in some of these groups. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to take a look at the COVID rates at the time and talk to Helen, see if it's appropriate. So it's subject to school committee approval again at that time. Uh, okay. These are all tentative and they're all subject to school committee approval. But we haven't submitted any plan to DESE because school committee has not approved the plan. Said, yeah. and we told right. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions or comments? Just, just to talk about Sheer Collins. Um, I want to thank all the staff. You, know, you look at a document like this, and I uh, talk about it, the old hours and hours and hours of work that had to go into the recovery. And just uh, thank you for all the effort. And I'm being thank you. And, uh, any other questions or comments? If not, is there a motion to? Well, can I just oh, yeah, so that, and, and I just do want to thank the staff. A Herculean effort since this this uh, COVID crisis has come about. The staff has just worked tirelessly. Again, this document's outstanding, really well done. Reflects the best thinking across the state. But people have been working twenty four seven to make sure uh, we're, 
doing the right thing for our kids. And I just want to publicly thank the staff because they've been outstanding. And this is just one reflection of that. Thank you, everyone. And I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the staff too. And I want to thank the synergy that we've had for a number of years of the school department working with like the city team, and my cabinet heads, and rank and file have been tested. And true, I say it all the time to remember natural man made disaster. Not a lot of districts have this synergy at times. Yeah. And we've all worked together in a very trying time. So I'm very grateful uh, uh, to the staff's effort and, and to the school committee's uh, efforts also. Because you, I know a lot of times you'll see meetings, but a lot of the work that gets done in subcommittees, hours and hours, these working sessions. And, but I don't think anybody, I could be wrong, I don't think anybody has been more comprehensive and action oriented uh, than we have in the Commonwealth as far as our city side plans and our school plans and, and putting our money where our mouth is. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I don't think anybody else had anything else to say. Okay, is there a motion on the floor to adjourn? Don't move. <laughs> so, I, I thought I had to put that on a gallotone. There's a motion by Mr. Taylor. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Perez. Roll call vote is required because this is uh, Zooming or whatever it's called. Uh, so, Madam Clerk, could you please? I don't have this on my edge sketch. Could you please call the roll, please? Ms. Naylor. Yes. Attorney Murphy. Yes. Ms. Hurst. Yes. Ms. Gresham? Yes. Ms. Perez? Yes. Mr. Collins? I want to keep going. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Sarno? Yes, more than sufficient role. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. 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 Thank you, everybody.